Moving across the world with your pet is no easy task, and if you have a French Bulldog, the process at times can seem nearly impossible. In the past few years, there have been many changes to how Frenchies are transported internationally, and these changes have led to a lot of frustration and confusion. Much of the information I was able to find over many months of research turned out to be false or outdated, so I wanted to share what I learned. As someone who successfully was able to relocate their five-year-old French Bulldog from the U.S. to Turkey via Germany, I wanted to let you know of some of the options you have available, what the process was like for me, and tips I picked up along the way. There are a few options I was able to find for transporting a Frenchie over the ocean. I'll share these in no particular order. The first and most controversial option is sending them as cargo on a plane. While this is still not impossible to do, despite what the internet seems to think, it is a bit more difficult and poses more risk. The problem with moving a French Bulldog via cargo of the plane is that Frenchies are part of the brachycephalic category of dogs, which tend to be more prone to breathing issues, which could potentially be exacerbated by sitting on hot tarmacs or from the stress that traveling by cargo could cause. So after a number of deaths, almost all airlines have banned these sort of dogs as traveling as either excess baggage or cargo. However, as of late 2022, both Lufthansa and Turkish Airlines still shipped French Bulldogs as cargo. Both of these airlines will not allow Frenchies to be flown as excess baggage, and rather they need to be flown as manifest cargo. Essentially, the dogs still fly in the exact same temperature-controlled and pressurized compartment in the hold of the plane, but the way that they are treated is a bit different. And since they're considered manifest cargo, both of these airlines also require that you work directly with their cargo divisions, Lufthansa Cargo and Turkish Cargo. And then to make it even more complicated, they also both require that you use a third-party pet shipping service certified with IPADA to help facilitate the transportation, and they won't work directly with the customer. The International Pet and Animal Transportation Association, or IPADA for short, is a group of pet transporter businesses that are all certified in the safe transport of pets. On the IPADA website, they let you easily search for pet shippers based on a variety of criteria. Just note that not all IPADA shippers are willing to work with Frenchies, so you may need to reach out to quite a few before finding one that will accept you. The pet shipper basically works as a middleman to facilitate the move of your pet. Their services can vary greatly depending on what you need from them. However, just as an example, when we inquired about a drop-off near the Chicago airport and pick up at the Istanbul airport, we were quoted over $6,000. And since these dogs are considered manifest cargo, there is a customs clearance that happens during business hours. So if your dog arrives outside of these hours, they will have to stay overnight at the airport at the customs facility until the next day. Also, due to the sensitivity some snub-nosed dogs have, they won't allow them to be flown as cargo when it's either too hot or too cold. So in the end, despite our Frenchie never having breathing issues, the unknown with having her out of our possession scared us a little too much, but I still just wanted to mention this as an option. Another option available is to charter a private jet. There's a Facebook group called Chartered Air Travel with Pets that helps to match individuals that are looking to travel with their pets privately all to the same location. Here your Frenchie can comfortably sit with you without the worry about the restrictions most commercial airlines have. They have a document set up with proposed departure and arrival locations, dates, the organizer, and then you can see if any of the potential flights fit your needs and coordinate with the organizer. This is the most expensive option I found with the least amount of potential routes, so you'd likely need to be flexible with timing and travel. One of the most common routes I saw people take was New Jersey to Lisbon, Portugal, and depending on how many seats there are, this usually costs around $10,000 per person. This luxury option comes with a luxury price tag, so in the end this was an absolute last resort for us. One other option I found available for getting your Frenchie at least across the pond is the Queen Mary 2 Ocean Liner with Cunard Lines. This ocean liner goes from New York to England and has kennels on board for your furry friend. And from my research, it seems like their kennels are usually booked roughly a year in advance, so you'd likely need to plan way ahead for this. I don't know pricing offhand, but I'll leave a link in the description to their website, along with all the others that I mentioned, in case this interests you. And finally, I wanted to tell you about the option we ended up going with, which was taking our French Bulldog in cabin with us. 
For the longest time, I actually thought this wasn't an option, since almost all airlines have weight restrictions on in-cabin pets, with the maximum weight usually being about 17 pounds or 8 kilos, which Fig was way over. However, I was able to find a few airlines that didn't have a weight limit and that flew internationally, and they were United, Delta, and a business class only airline called La Compagnie. United may make you demonstrate upon check-in that your dog is able to stand and turn around without touching the sides of the carrier, so that was out of the question as Fig is too tall for that. However, Delta does not require a standing and turning demonstration. Their requirement is that the dog must fit comfortably in the carrier under the seat in front of you. I prefer Delta regardless of traveling with the dog or not, and they were significantly less expensive than La Compagnie and offered more than just one route. So in the end, we ended up flying with Delta and had a wonderful experience. Next, I wanted to tell you a bit more about the process we took to get our Frenchie from the U.S. to Turkey. First and foremost, I'd recommend checking out the USDA APHIS website before making any appointments or booking any travel. The Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service website is your number one stop for accurate and up-to-date information regarding pet travel to and from the U.S. And here you can get a complete list of everything that you're going to need to know before moving your pet, along with all documents that are necessary. I spoke with someone from APHIS and they let me know that all the information provided on their website is up to date and are the agreed upon terms of entry between the U.S. and that country. So I trust that this information is more correct than anything that you can find just doing a random Google search. Knowing precisely what is needed from you to legally enter another country with your pet will certainly make your planning go a bit smoother. From personal experience, looking at this information ahead of time helped us out a lot. We noticed that her three-year rabies vaccine was not valid for entry to the EU and needed to be the one-year dose, so we made sure to get that done way ahead of time of the final vet appointment for the health certificate since there needs to be a waiting period. Had we not seen that ahead of time, we would have had to wait longer. Next, we decided to book the flight. We called Delta directly for booking since you're currently unable to do so through their website. A limited number of pets are allowed per flight and per cabin, and depending on the plane, they may have different maximum underseat dimensions allowable for the carrier, so it's best to book with the person on the phone anyhow. Also, I'd highly recommend a refundable ticket. There are a lot of variables that go into moving internationally with a pet, many of which are going to be out of your control, and the little bit extra it costs is well worth the flexibility that it gives you. The fee for our French Bulldog was only $200, which is very reasonable given the other options we had. The only downside was that Delta didn't have any direct flights to Istanbul. Instead, we flew from Chicago to Frankfurt, and the rest of the journey to Turkey was via trains and car, which I'll discuss in a little bit. In order for our French Bulldog to enter Germany from the U.S., she needed to visit a USDA certified vet to fill out her health certificate within 30 days of arrival, which is actually a fairly generous amount of time compared to other countries. Not all vets are certified to fill out the health certificate, so you may need to call around. At the appointment, the vet will access a portal on the USDA APHIS website that's specifically for vets. From here, they'll pull up the health certificate for that country that you're going to be going to, and then they'll do an exam just to make sure that the dog is healthy and meets all the requirements to enter that country. After the vet enters all the information needed, they'll sign and date it in all the appropriate spots, but you're not done yet because then the vet will electronically submit it to their local USDA APHIS office for the final endorsement from the USDA. The USDA requires an overnight prepaid mailing label for them to be able to send the final endorsed document back to you. And depending on your vet, they may either ask you to provide this label or they may create one for you. In our case, the vet provided mailing for us and submitted the electronic label along with the completed health certificate to the USDA APHIS office. For Germany, the health certificate is valid for 30 days once your vet submits it for endorsement, so make sure to plan your vet visit accordingly. Once the USDA receives the filled out electronic certificate from the vet, they'll look to see that everything is correct Germany only requires that the certificate be endorsed within 10 days of arrival, which allows for plenty of time for delivery, but not all countries are as generous with turnaround time. So when the timing is right, they'll emboss, sign, and date the health certificate and mail it back to you with your prepaid mailing label. Overall, with the exams, the health certificate, endorsement, the one-year rabies shot, as well as some additional treatments and rabies titer tests we needed for entry into Turkey, we ended up spending over $900 at this point. 
Every vet charges a little bit differently, but I'd say the prices were about average for each item from what I could research. After receiving the endorsed health certificate in the mail, we were all set from a paperwork perspective. Getting Fig ready for her flight was fairly simple. We purchased the Sherpa Deluxe large carrier off of Amazon for $37, I think it was. It was really well constructed with a flexible frame and sturdy bottom. There was also a pocket for storage and it had a removable fuzzy lining that could be washed. Delta's recommendation for the carrier is 11 by 11 by 18 inches, but since this was a bit flexible, it still fit their specification when smushed down a little bit. They do mention on their website that the carriers for international travel have to have four sides of ventilation. This carrier had three sides, so we attached some netting on the top to make it four sides and complied in case they wanted to check. Delta's website has all of their rules regarding international pet travel, so I would check there for all the details. Fig got used to the carrier quite quickly. I used the command in and put a treat in the end of the carrier so once she got in she was rewarded and after a few days she would go into the carrier all by herself to nap. At first I thought she seemed too big for her carrier, which was my big worry, but with practice it became easier for her to turn around and get comfortable. Keep in mind with Delta, the pet carrier counts as your carry-on bag, so you are only allowed a personal item in addition to the carrier. We packed baby wipes, a small amount of food, collapsible food and water bowls, a few puppy pads, some treats, a toy, her heart guard medicine, and she wore her harness and leash with the waste bag dispenser attached, her ID tag, and an Apple Air tag, just in case. We also packed a folder with her health certificate, most recent rabies vaccine certificate, her microchip ID card, and her rabies titer test results, which I'll get to in just a minute. My husband traveled with Fig, and on the day of departure, he checked in as normal. The Delta representative asked to see Fig's paperwork. They attached a little tag to her carrier showing that she was allowed on the plane, and then they went through security. You'll be asked to take your pet out of their carrier to go through security, but otherwise your dog must remain in their carrier at all times in the airport. Be sure to limit food and water intake on the day of departure and bring them to go to the bathroom before boarding. Most airports have designated pet relief areas, but Fig doesn't like walking on fake turf, so we brought a puppy pad to use in the bathroom stall if needed. She was a really good girl the whole flight and slept peacefully in her carrier. Delta requires that the pets stay in their carrier, so make sure to abide by this rule. Finally, they reached Frankfurt. After exiting the plane, they went through customs as normal. Just be prepared to show your health certificate when asked to by officials. After passing through customs, they were on their way to fetch their suitcase and make their way outside for Fig's potty break. Now this is where it gets a bit more complex with our story. Fig traveled by land the rest of the way to Turkey via train and car since we weren't able to find a European airline that would accept her in cabin. The USDA told us they would only issue a health certificate for Germany since the rest of her journey would take a little bit more time. Normally, they're able to issue multiple health certificates, and they even state that the health certificate for the first country you'd enter would be considered a transit certificate until reaching your final destination. But for some reason, the duration of the journey from Germany to Turkey gave them issue, even though they wouldn't tell us what period of time the transit certificate was good for. It's a bit silly if you ask me, so what we had to do instead was visit a vet in Germany to get Fig her EU pet passport. The pet passport allows for transport of pets through the EU and also acts as a certificate to get Fig into Turkey since it's outside of the EU. I contacted a few vets about a month prior to departure and found one that was able to issue the EU pet passport with same day turnaround. I emailed the vet ahead of time all of Fig's medical history and all she needed when she arrived was her USDA issued health certificate along with the results of her rabies titer test. The titer test measures the amount of rabies vaccine in the dog's system, and many countries may require this for entry. To get the EU pet passport, she actually didn't need the rabies titer test, but for her to enter Turkey, she did, so we had to have those results entered into her passport. The vet in Frankfurt was reasonable and only cost 50 euros for exam and pet passport, which they issued the same day. After a night in Frankfurt, they then took the train to Budapest. The Deutsche Bahn website said that there was a fee to bring your pet aboard, but for some reason they weren't charged and were just told she needed to remain in her carrier. Once in Budapest, they met up with my husband's friend, who if you can believe it, drove all the way from Turkey to pick him and Fig up. 
They drove the rest of the way through Hungary, Serbia, and Bulgaria, and finally made it to Turkey without issue. This whole process was quite the emotional roller coaster with many roadblocks along the way. There were a lot of times I almost gave up hope that it was even possible to move big, but in the end we were able to, and I learned a lot of valuable lessons. My first tip is to plan early. Depending on the country you're going to, you may need to make time for specific vaccinations or tests, and you'll also need to make time for appointments. In the latter half of 2022, we were having a really hard time finding a USDA certified vet that was accepting new patients, and even when they were, many were booked out a month in advance or more. So try your best to become familiar with what will be needed and when. My second tip is to not rely completely on the vet to be the expert on health certificates. Even vets that claim to be experienced with the process would give us contradictory information from what the USDA APHIS would give. In addition, we were shocked to see how many mistakes they made on the certificates. They mixed up various lines on the form, entered in dates incorrectly, spelled our names wrong, wrote down the incorrect microchip number. These all may seem like minor mistakes, but on such official paperwork, it could mean a delayed certificate or even being denied entry. With both your vet and the USDA, I'd recommend being your own best advocate. Consistently following up with your vet and the USDA, regardless of how annoying you feel you're being, is really important. Before your vet submits the health certificate to APHIS for approval, triple check that all lines are filled in with correct information and that they've included the correct address for your return label and provide you with tracking. I'd also recommend following up with the correct APHIS office to make sure that your certificate is being worked on and keep checking your tracking information to see when it's on its way. Finally, my last tip is to be prepared for change. And by this I mean that there are going to be a lot of steps in this process that are completely out of your control and you have to be prepared to pivot if needed. So when possible, make your travel as flexible as you can and create backup plans. I hope you got at least a little bit of value from this video. When I first started looking into how to move Fig across the world, I was having a really hard time getting information, especially for her particular breed and the issues that it created. But now that I'm on the other side of it, I can say that with some planning and a lot of patience, it is possible. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to subscribe to my channel. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch, I really appreciate it, and I hope to see you soon. Thanks!